Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Sheep. I'm your host for tonight, Kieran Lynch. And we're going to look at some ways of making laminies or some practical tips that can be implemented on farms. So I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, fellow sheep specialist, Michael Gossin. Michael, you're very welcome on. Thanks, Kieran. And we're also joined by the sheep team in Ballyhays Agricultural College, Fergus O'Rourke and Niall Conaghy. Gents, you're both very welcome on. Good to have you. Thank you, Kieran. Cheers. Thanks, Kieran. Bit of a bit of a can before the storm, because I know you're not kicking off lamb for another two weeks. So look, we appreciate you coming on. So for tonight, um, Michael's going to kick us off first. We can see the screens up and sharing there already. To go through some of the kind of background tips and some things we need to consider, and then Fergus and Neil will join us later on. Just to go through some of the practical management tips they implement in the college. And look, hopefully we can find something there we can apply in our own farms at home and find useful. Certainly, you can always pick up stuff and these things. So, Michael, I think we've yours good to go. Gents, I might just get you to come off camera for a second and we'll join us. Uh, Michael, I'll hand over to you in a moment. So, for anyone that's, the attendees want to ask you a question, we have the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. If you type your question into that, I can ask it on your behalf. Um, Michael, I might throw somebody at me at the halfway point and, look, we'll do a wrap-up session with the tree at the very end. So, just use the Q&A tab, put the question into it, and we'll try and get around to as many as we can. So, Michael, over to you, and I'll join you again in a few minutes. Okay, Kieran, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, right, okay, so good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen, and um, welcome to this webinar, this evening's webinar. It's, it's just about tips and, and, and uh, tricks, I suppose, for for lambing. Um, and look at, I, I suppose, some of the the background to, I suppose, where we're going is, is 20 to 25% of the annual workload associated with, with sheep um is 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 at lambing time so it's it's a very kind of time dense period i suppose we have a lot of kind of the annual workload crammed into a very short period of time um creates a good bit of of, of stress and and a lot of work around that particular time and um okay, i suppose a couple of points there is you know that where things are well organized it, it results in in less work um but also better outcomes and the better outcomes is because things are done when they should be done and we'll be focusing a little bit about that about kind of preparing for lambing and getting ready and trying to to reduce the amount of work um the focus will be on facilities hygiene and supervision and we'll be sharing the the presentation um um and and look we'll be tick tacking over and back i'll be covering bits and then and, and fergus and i will be covering bits as well so look at and the other thing is i suppose a lot of the time that is spent when you think back to previous years lambing a lot of the time that's spent is actually dealing with those sick weak and problem sheep so take you know the yo that lambs down has two lambs lambs by herself and you know when you get into the pen the two lambs are starting to get up you you, you move that yo into an individual lambing pen and the, the lambs get up sucked by themselves and a day or two later she's outside in the field doing a great job on those lambs and you don't really have to deal with her the next time you see those lambs is at at dosing time at at, at five or six or seven weeks of age um there's there's not much work with that particular yo the, where, where the real work comes is the yo that you know, there's a lot of lambing difficulty, maybe then the lamb won't suck or, you know, maybe she has mastitis or she doesn't have a lot of milk and you're giving a lamb a bottle just to bring him on a bit until she comes into milk or maybe a lamb that gets watery mouth or, or a bit of, of um, joint heel and we're, we're running around trying to catch that lamb. And that's where an awful lot of the time is spent um, during lambing time is, OK, there's the, the general chores of having to lamb yos and clean up pens and get things ready and 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 do all the other farm jobs but an awful lot of time is, is spent dealing with those problem sheep and it's about trying to reduce that um so just in terms of facilities and facilities are 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 really what leads to organize organized work and being able to move sheep quickly in into the the the, the, the pens and having pens available for sheep not having to 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 um, chuck a yo out of a pen and clean it out to try and you know put another yo in because all the pens are full. So what we really should be targeting is eight to ten lambing pens per hundred yos. Um, so that's for a natural lambing flock, I suppose. Four out of ten, if you were synchronized, so somebody who was sponging yos now, for example, would would need a lot more pens. Obviously, the yos are coming much more compact. Fostering uh, pens one to three per fifty yos. And then group pins, two or three group pins per hundred yos. And that's really just to, to kind of, you know, when they empty the, the, the lambing pins, the individual lambing pins into those group pins before they go out into a small paddock or the field. And look, sometimes the weather is really good. 
at lambing time and maybe you have, you have a few small fields um, around there and you can get lambs straight out there and just observe them for a day or two just to make sure that things are going um, all right before they go into a bigger group, um, you know, and maybe further away from the yard. Buckets, okay, if we're using buckets and, and, and Niall and Fergus will be talking about that as well in terms of, of if we're using buckets for water and concentrates, about 25 buckets per 100 yards. Um, short trucks in six to nine metres length for per 100 yards and that's for the group pens because we'll be maybe feeding a bit of meal to the yards before they go out. And then really important, hot and cold water, um, ideally an under sink heater at a minimum, an electric kettle. And again, um, Niall and Fergus will be showing some of the facilities that they have in Belly Hayes um, and that they're using there. But I think these are kind of some of the, the, the kind of minimum targets that we should be aiming for. And everybody can have a look at those figures and see how you fare at home. And if you're a long way off them and you find that you're very busy at lambing time, then maybe that's that's an area that needs to be improved on. In terms of consumables and what do you need, and and I'm absolutely conscious when I put up this slide that straw is, is very expensive this year and in, in, in difficult to get and in short supply, but four to five round bales per hundred euros, and that's for the lambing pens, and and that's really an area that I think you know if you were short straw, that's not where you would be trying to to cut, because um, that's that's you know the barrier between the lambs and the bogs in the environment, and and that kind of using lots and plenty of clean straw around lambing time reduces the incidence of watery mouth and joint teal and all those kind of infections and, you know, a lot less problems, a lot better lamb thrive. So if you were going, saving straw, save it somewhere else, not not around lambing time, four to five round bales they're needed per hundred yards lambing. Round bale, about one round bale of hay um, for the yards while they're in the individual pens. We should really be aiming to to give both roughage and a bit of meal uh, plus water to the yards while they're in that uh, lambing pen for, you know, at least 25 or, or 24 hours. Someone might be in for a little bit longer. Lime, um, so lots of different types of lime out there, cubicle lime, hydrated lime, builder's lime. There's various different blends of hydrated and cubicle lime and all that type of thing. Look, it doesn't, I don't think it really matters what lime you're using as long as you're using a particular product to disinfect the pens, clean out the pens after each lambing. If you clean out the pens after each lambing, it's not a big job. Um, you know, it's a couple of pikes or sprungs of 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 hay and, and, and material to remove. It's easily done. If if you don't uh, do that and it starts building up, then it's a it's a big job and it won't be done. And obviously there's significant infection challenge if we just keep topping up pens with straw. Um, there's a buildup of organic matter and, and feces and urine and all that and, and dampness in that pen. And that's not really great from, from a, a lamb hygiene point of view. You always drink a lot of water. Um, you know, so you always will uh, drink up to 10 litres of water per day after lambing. That depends obviously on how much water um, they're getting from the forage. So if it's wet silage, they'll drink a little bit less. If it's dry hay, they'll, they, they, they'll drink a little bit more. Um, so we need to give them water. Um, so there's a number of options there. And again, Fergus and, and, and uh, Niall are going to go through those. Look at um, depending on what system you have, if you're using buckets, then a barrel is, is the minimum. A couple of barrels suitably located, ideally with a ball cock for filling, just makes that job really, really quick. You know, if you have a 200 litre barrel there outside the, the shed door, you know, you'll fill 20, 30 buckets in, in, in minutes. Like, you know, if you're waiting for a hose to do that, then it's a huge job and there's a lot of time, you know, downtime there with somebody standing there with a hose filling buckets. The, I suppose then when it gets to, to we have the lamb and the, the yo and the lamb inside in the, the, the lambing pen, how do we get kind of, you know, good mothering ability? And, you know, we often talk about the yo as a, a great mother and mothering ability is actually influenced by, by by a good few things. And one of those is body condition score. So yo's that are in poor body condition make poor mothers. There's a lot of research around that. Like, you know, that's pretty well documented at this stage. So yo's that are in poor body condition, uh, tend to make poor mothers. So that that's a challenge for us at this stage, I suppose, whatever body condition score most of the O's are in, that's what they're going to be at. At best, at lambing time, you're not going to make up a whole pile of ground. Um, now, most people are kind of, you know, a month or, 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 or a little bit with it, maybe away from lambing. Um, so it, it that's really a message for next year. Parity, obviously, older O's, and we all know that to spend more time, older O's are, are more inclined to to look after their lambs a little bit better, maybe than some of the younger O's, the O lambs or the Hoggett O's. 
skills. Um, and lambing difficulty has an impact. So trying to minimize lambing difficulty. So so the audit is 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 spending a long time there trying to lamb and and by the time she eventually lambs, you know, she she she's absolutely um snuffed like wrecked and 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 you know in, in significant pain and discomfort. She's not going to be that attentive towards her lamb. So trying to to assist early when when lambing is 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 becoming difficult, using lots of lube and all all that type of thing just to make make the the the, the process a little bit easier for the yo, um, and that can help also uh, for the yo to to bond with the with the mother. And then I suppose in terms of yo and lamb recognition, so how do yos recognize their lambs? How do lambs recognize their mother? So so yos uh, recognize their lambs initially by sound uh, by smell and then by sound. Um, and lambs generally recognize recognize their 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 dam by by sound, and there, there's a good bit of research done on this down in the southern hemisphere, um, and and they've identified that you know the yos actually are able to recognize lambs very very early, so kind of less than you know twelve hours, but it takes a, a good bit longer for the lambs to be able to, to identify the mom, um, and that's the reason why we 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 recommend the twenty four hours. It's not that somebody just said look twenty four hours sounds like a great um, length of time to keep a yo as a minimum inside an, an individual lambing pen. The 24 hours is to to make sure that the lamb is able to recognize its mom. Um, and, and that's why we need to be doing that. So then I, I suppose, look, at the, that's the, the, the point I'm making there. Keep them in the individual pen for 24 hours. Ideally, then in, in a group pen with five to seven other yos and their lambs, that's just for the, the lambs to be able to identify their moms and find them and know that the other yo is going to puck them when they walk over to her, um, that type of thing, harden them up before they go out. That's ideal. Um, you know, and then obviously we need a pen as well to retain problem sheep. And that's very important to have a couple of hospital pens um, where we can keep sheep uh, that need to be kept in for a little bit longer um, just to supervise them. You know, and foster yo's probably fall into that category. We probably need to keep foster yo's in for a day or two longer just to make sure that they've fully accepted the lambs and that they're not going to change their mind. OK, very important, I suppose, is that we mark the lambs um, with a number and put the, a number, the same number, obviously, on the yo as well. And it's important that we mark the lambs on the same side as we mark the yo. And that's because generally if we're out the field watching a yo and she's walking away from us, which is a natural thing for you to do when you're starting to approach her, the lambs will walk, follow the mom and they'll be walking the same direction. So if they're marked on the same side, we can obviously see that the no, read a number. If they're marked on the opposite side, you know, it, it, it makes it very difficult to identify are those the, 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 the lambs belonging to that yo. I'd be advocating we use a different colour for single lambs, twin lambs, and in some cases where people rear triplets on yos, you'd want a different colour for triplets as well. And that's a simple system where basically, you know, for example, if the single uh, yos uh, rearing single lambs are, are identified with a blue number, if I see a yo, their number, you know, 57, and she's got a blue mark on her. I know I know straight away when I'm out the field, well, there should only be one lamb following her with a blue 57 on it. Whereas if that yo was a red 57, well, I, now I know, well, th there should be two 57 lambs walking after that particular yo. And also, I suppose we need a system for identifying yos with fostered lambs. And we need to be able to identify which is the lamb that was fostered to the yo and which is the lamb um, that's her own lamb. And there's a very simple way of doing this. And I, I, I I'll show it here in the next slide. So here on the bottom picture, we have a, a, a yo here and she's got a red 49 on her side. And you can see you have, you have two lambs here, one with 49 and this is the second lamb, he's 49 and it's on the same side. So if the yo is, is moving away from me and I'm standing on, on this side of her, I can read it and I'll see the two lambs. The yo here on the top now, this is a yo that has, has 47 on her and she also has an F here um, further up on, on, on her bum. Uh, and you can see this is her own lamb. So that lamb is just depicted with 47 in red, obviously, because there's two lambs. And on the other side here, we have the foster lamb, and that has a 47, but it has an F on it as well to denote that that lamb is fostered. So when I see that yo out the field, I know, okay, she's twins, she's 47, uh, red, red marked. There should be two lambs following her, but there's also an F on her. So one of her lambs is a foster lamb, and this is the particular lamb that has been fostered. And I can keep an eye on that lamb uh, and see, you know, is the lamb is the lamb doing well? We've inc Incidentally, we've looked at this and, and pulled together a lot of the data from the Better Farm program over a number of years where we've identified yos and lambs that have been fostered. And we find that actually fostering works quite well on farms. 
you know, on the Better Farm program, we're seeing that over 90% of the lambs that have been fostered onto yours are still there um, and doing well at seven weeks of age when we do our first weighings. Like, and that that's a sure sign at that stage they're well out in the field and, and the yo is doing the business for them. Um, so, you know, fostering, if, it, if it's carried out correctly, works really well and it's a good way of getting surplus lambs off onto yo's that have either lost lambs or, or yo's that are, are, are only um, uh, lambing down with a single lamb. We are going to have some small, weak and sick lambs. And I, I suppose that's one of the, the 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 things that, you know, happens on farm, no matter how how good or well we're running it. We're going to have a couple of yos that have, have maybe small lambs or a, a lamb that's had a very difficult birth and maybe has had some little bit of an injury or something like that. And that's going to have to be kept inside. And they require extra attention, um, you know, uh, to make sure that they're fed and that they survive. And very, you know, a very useful tool for these is to have a heat lamp. And I suppose the big the big thing about heat lamps is the danger associated with having, a, a you know, a heat source in a shed where you have straw, which is a very flammable uh, material. So very important important when we're using a heat lamp. A lot of heat lamps just hung inside in pens with yo's. Often the yo might decide to she takes a dislike to this heat lamp and starts beating it up against the pen wall and next thing, bang, off comes the bulb down on top of the straw and, you know, if you're unlucky and we've all probably heard stories of sheds that have gone up um, in, in, in flames with that. So simple kind of a solution is, is to have some sort of a, a really good guard. The little guard that is on those heat lamp isn't going to take um, the beating of a yo if she starts to to, to to go to go at it. So we need something strong and sturdy to to basically protect the heat lamp. That's a, a little homemade job there, welded out of steel, and it has a little mesh at the bottom there just in case something did happen to catch it. And the yo can't get at the heat lamp uh, at the bulb and knock down, and the lamps can lie in under it here and and stay quite warm. And that's that's a very useful tool, um, and it's something that people should have on hand, but also have a way of protecting their shed from from going on 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 fire. Okay, so. Obviously, these um, smaller and, and uh, weaker lambs need longer in individual pens. You know, some of those might be in there for two or three days um, just to make sure that they get going. And look, it pays to look after lambs because at that stage, you know, the big cost is associated with keeping the O. Um, and if you can get every extra lamb you can get to survive is is has a significant impact on, on the amount of money you're going to get at the end of the year. So the other thing is, I suppose, have a heat box. And heat boxes are quite useful in terms of, of heating up chilled lambs and also glucose to hand and we'll talk a little bit um, about that. So that brings me on to the whole area of nutrition and colostrum. And look at when our lambs are born, they're born with, you know, relatively or little immunity. So they need to get the immune, uh, passive immunity from their mom. Uh, and that comes in the form of colostrum. So we have it has antibodies in the, in the colostrum. We need to try and get 50 mils per kilogram in the first feed into every lamb. Um, so for a 5 kg lamb, that's 250 mils. Now, typically when we talk to a group of farmers, they're using a 60 mil syringe um, to stomach tube lambs maybe, and they would be giving, you know, your typical twin lamb maybe, you know, two or possibly three of those 60 mil syringes. And for a 5 kilo lamb, that's just not enough. We need to be giving at least four. It's very important that the first feed is a big feed. Um, you know, so I'd be advocating that, that, that people would kind of, you know, look at, at that, most yos are going to um, lamb down. The lambs will get up and they'll do all of this themselves. So there's no need to intervene if the lambs are good to suck and you come around two or three hours after after the yo has lambed and the lamb is sitting there and he's, he's, he's full to the gills of milk. No problem. No need to go stomach tubing or milking or do anything with that. This, what I'm talking about here is the lambs where that doesn't happen. Okay, so it's a lamb that's, you know, weak or sickly or or the yo doesn't have enough milk or maybe the yo isn't taken to the lamb and leaving the lamb suck and we have to intervene. And at that stage, I suppose it's about, uh, it's about um, you know, milking the yo, trying to get as much colostrum out of her as possible. If we're short of colostrum, um, then we need to make sure that every lamb gets at least some yo's colostrum. And that's very important so that we get the antibodies into the lamb. So maybe that means if we've harvested a little bit of colostrum from a single bearing yo that had a lot of milk or something like that, that's great. That's the best option. I suppose if, if that's not available, then um, we're talking about looking at some of the colostrum substitutes, um, you know, or potentially cow's colostrum. If we're using the colostrum substitutes, just be aware that while they're substitutes in terms of energy and 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 protein, they're not great in terms of, of immunoglobulin transfer, you know, 
probably somewhere on a scale of one to ten, with Joe's milk being ten, they're probably somewhere in the region of of one to four or five. Um, so not not near as good as as Joe's colostrum. The important thing is to make sure that every lamb gets a bit of Joe's colostrum. If we're using cow's colostrum, very important that we mix the colostrum from a number of cows. Don't just take it from one cow, because some cows have an anti lamb antibody which can cause mortality in lambs and. You know, by you getting colostrum from a number of cows, we're reducing the risk of that happening. Second thing, I suppose, with the cow's colostrum is if you're feeding cow's colostrum, you need to increase the rate by about one third. So cow's colostrum is is more watery than yours colostrum. So we need to be feeding about 70 mils of cow's colostrum per kg of body weight. And and, and I, I suppose the third thing, if you're using cow's colostrum, is just be aware that, um, you know, there are some diseases that sheep can get from cattle, one of those being yonase. Um, so if you were um, selecting cows or getting milk from, from either sucker cows or, or dairy cows, try to get them from a herd where that is yonase free. So I suppose that brings me to um, this lamb survival flow chart from which we, we've we've borrowed from AHDB in the UK. And this is basically where you find a lamb that is hypothermic. Um, and it, it looks very, very complicated. I can kind of simplify it for people. Um, this is a, a lamb under five hours of age. Generally, that particular lamb will have still brown fat reserves. If that lamb is, is, is hypothermic, is under the weather, um, we're talking about drying the lamb, put it into a warming box and Bob's your uncle, that should solve the problem. Um, I suppose where we have lambs that are, are older, um, so lambs that are over five hours of age, they generally will have burnt up their fat reserves, their brown fat reserves. And especially, you know, what happens every year on farms, you go out in the morning and there's a lamb there either in the lambing pens that, you know, didn't get the amount of milk we thought it had got. And here it is stretched out in the morning time, can't stand up, can't hold up its head. Um, or you go out into the field after a bad night and there's a lamb that might be out for two or three days. And, and you know, mom has decided not to feed it or mom got mastitis or something. And um, lamb is stretched out in the field, still alive, but barely there, um, unable to stand up, unable to, to lift its head. And that particular lamb, um, they need a glucose injection. And that's the important um, thing for that particular lamb. So if that lamb gets a stomach tube or gets put under a heat lamp, you've really done for it, like, you know, because it it can't metabolize metabolize the break down the food and 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 metabolize it and the body temperature is, is dropping rapidly um so what we're talking about there is giving a glucose injection and and that's an important trick for farmers to learn um how to do that and this is is, is what we're talking about it's a it's a hypothermic lamb getting an interpertoneal injection and then being placed in a warming box um if that if if we've got it in time and we do it properly that lamb should be open and walking around in about an hour an hour and a half and at that stage then we can tube it or feed it and and obviously need to figure out why that happened check has the mom milk is she still taking the lamb or whatever make alternative arrangements where do we inject the lamb so we inject the lamb here an inch out from the navel and an inch down from the navel with a one inch needle um into that peritoneal interperitoneal cavity there aiming for the base of the tail at a 45 degree angle so it's 10 ml of of a 20 percent dextrose or glucose solution and and you inject that in there um, 10 ml per kg. So for your typical four or five kilo lamb, you'll be talking about 40 to 50 mils of a, of that solution. To make that up, um, 100 mils of boiled water into a cup, um, add in 40 grams of glucose. So that's about three heaped tablespoons. Um, mix it up, draw out your solution, your 40 mils or 50 mils for the lamb. Um, in, uh, push the needle in there, the full one inch uh, all the way to the hub aiming for the base of the tail at that 45 degree angle. Pull back a little bit on the syringe to make sure that we don't have blood or urine in it. If we have blood or urine, we could be in the bladder or a kidney. In that case, we'd be taking the needle out, discarding the contents and starting again. Highly unlikely that that's going to happen. In most cases, when you pull back in the syringe, you'll have nothing inside in the syringe, only the fluids that you've, you'll have in it starting out. Inject the 40 or 50 mils of, of that um, solution in there. Put the lamb into the warming box and it's, it's a real miraculous type of 
um, process. You know, it's amazing actually how those lambs that are literally on death's door and you think are almost dead by the time you pick them up, how they actually recover and 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 survive. So it's a useful trick. Um, it's something that all farmers should should try in order for it to work. You obviously need to have the glucose and everything to hand. This you'll be finding these lambs early in the morning. You won't have time to go down to the co-op or the the local health food store to get those supplies. Um, you know, and 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 to do that. So look at, I suppose, then in terms of hygiene, hygiene is very important. And and again, um, Fergus and, and Niall are going to talk about that. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the the contaminated bedding, just but the um the type of equipment we have, very important that we clean and sterilize um our equipment between um uses. And and there's a simple procedure there that we we're kind of advocating that farmers should should have. So it's a three bucket system. So you have a bucket of water with washing up liquid in it. You have a second bucket of water just to rinse. And then you have a third bucket of water with sterilization fluid in it. So that's something like Milton or there are all these various different sterilization fluids that are on the market there that people use to sterilize babies' bottles. Um, those sterilization fluids work in so far as that once something is clean and totally immersed inside them, it sterilizes them in 15 minutes. And, and they generally last for about 20 24 hours. So we we use that system to wash, rinse, and sterilize everything from bottles, stomach tubes, lambing ropes, lamb pullers, jugs, mixing whisks, everything. And that basically ensures that we're not passing infection from lamb to lamb, you know, from the environment when we're lambing yours with the ropes or the lamb pullers or all of that. And it it, it helps to reduce um, lamb mortality and improve flock health by doing that. So I suppose then just a, a quick um, rundown through fostering. So when we're trying to foster lambs onto yours, the best system, I suppose, for fostering lambs onto yours is, is wet fostering. Um, ideally, we'd be assisting in the birth of the, so this is a single bearing yo that we were going to foster a lamb onto. Um, try to catch as much of the lambing fluids as possible. So some farmers will take in with them a plastic, either a fertilizer bag or a meal bag, put it under the oil as their lamb and her. That'll catch a lot of the fluids and stop it from seeping down through the straw. Have your 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 lamb that you intend to foster onto the oil there. Have her washed. Um, to re remove as much of the smell as we can from from her from her her birth and immobilized. I find cable ties are very useful there for immobilizing those lambs. Look different people use different things and um, whatever works for you immerse the foster lamb in the fluids and there is some research showing that if you stimulate the o for a pseudo lambing that 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 assists you know personally i don't do that but look at some people talk about it and certainly there's research done on that in scotland and then some farmers also suggest sprinkling a little bit of salt on the foster lamb to encourage the o to lick it remove the o's own lamb for about 20 minutes and then when you're putting the your own lamb back you clip the cable ties off the legs and observe them mothering and, and off they go and and hopefully all will be well and the yo will be rearing the two lambs happily for us um going forward. So Kieran, that's uh that's me I suppose. Um at that stage I'm gonna hand back to you and if there's any couple of questions, I'll yep. take them maybe while the, the the lads are starting to share their their screen. That's perfect, Michael. Thanks and you stop sharing there. So Fergus might just get you to start sharing. Michael just you mentioned Wade Foster there and there was a couple of questions in just about how you go about it, you've outlined the practice of it. Like in reality, you're going to know very quick that's either going to work or hasn't worked. How long would you persevere afterwards? It should really have clicked straight away if it's done right. Yeah, look at generally, generally, I mean, you, you'll know a couple of hours later if the O is allowing the lambs to suckle, um, you know, and if, she, if she's looking after them and, 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 and licking them around the pen, you know, it, it has worked. And generally, that's what we'd be hoping for. Yeah, occasionally we can get the odd yo that maybe might change her mind and then people might put her into a fostering crate or, or something like that and persevere with her. Some people will just take the lamb off and try again, like, you know. So th those are the options. And I suppose, look, at it depends on on the proportion of singles we have to triplets and things like that. And sometimes this mightn't even be a single yo. It could be a yo that lambs down and she has a dead lamb and we're trying to foster two fresh lambs, two different lambs onto her as well. Like, But I mean, certainly what we're seeing is, you know, we, we were always asking that question of the yo's that go out with the fostered lambs. How many of them actually work out? You know what I mean? Are, are these lambs being lost out the field and, and Mr. Fox comes along and, 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 and takes them and we don't, we don't figure out. And when we've looked at that on the, on the better farm program over, you know, number of years of data um the, it, it, it's very successful and you know the not only is it successful in, insofar as that the lambs are are still knocking around 
at seven weeks of age, but the lambs are doing well. The fostered lambs are doing well, which means, you know, they're being well looked after by the yo. So the yo has, has, has been duped into thinking that this is her lamb and she's doing the job for us. Yeah, I think it's something we often question before. It was a nice bit to look back and like at that seven week phase, you're hoping at that point they're over that, that rough edge so they've gone on. Fergus, I might just get you to start sharing your screen there. Can I That's me? perfect. Whenever it's up. Michael, I have a couple more questions coming in for you there. I'll give you a chance to to think about them and catch your breath. And just get you going full screen, Fergus. Okay, hopefully yeah, that's no, up there yeah, now. Yeah, no, it's coming up there now. So look, myself and Michael, jump off for a minute. We'll let you go through some of the practical things you're putting in place in Ballyhage, yourself and Niall. Um, we'll join you then. So again, just for the attendees, we have a couple of questions in on the Q&A tab. If there's anything you want to ask Michael or Fergus and Niall, type in your question, I'll ask it on your behalf at the end. So Fergus, I'll hand over to yourself and Niall now and we'll join you in a few moments. That's perfect. Thanks, Kieran, and good evening to all your viewers. So, look at as Kieran says, Fergus O'Rourke is my name. I'm one of the sheep teachers here in uh, Ballyhays College. Okay, so I suppose in terms of the little bit of background on the college enterprise here, the sheep enterprise. So we're operating a flock of approximately 170 breeding yows. They're predominantly Suffolk and Texel bred yows. And I suppose we're also, you know, operating a closed flock here as well. And there's about 40 replacements they are retained this year. And uh, they have been kept, you know, they're, they're mainly Belclare bred lambs. So they would have been lambs kept from the Belclare rams. Okay, so I suppose in terms of the rams used, there's a good mix of terminal sires there in terms of Suffolk and Texel and Charlie. And as I said, there's also some Belclare rams as well. Uh, you know, look at 2023 was a, a tough year in terms of getting lambs finished, but you know, kind of the the aim of the game here is to have at least 70% of the lambs finished off grass and the remainder on on concentrates. And I suppose the the wee map on the right hand side there indicates the 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 sheep block. There's over 200 hectares on the Ballyhays um, farm here, but uh, we have 24 hectares, and that's devoted to a grassland in terms of multi-sword species, a grass white clover, and there's a small remainder of the swords left to be receded there, about five hectares. So that's kind of a background. You know, we're working with various different groups of students, part-time, full-time, distance. Uh, we also have a degree program here as well. So there's a couple of hundred students could be here throughout the week, not all at the same time. So it's it's quite a busy spot, um, to say the least. So I suppose just a little bit of background in terms of, uh, you know, and it's it's linked to the purpose of this evening's webinar, you know, when do losses occur at lambing? And I suppose we can do all the things right, pre-breeding, getting the, the, the O's in good condition and appropriate RAM to O ratios and nutrition and whatnot. But unfortunately, it can still go wrong at lambing. And there was a study completed a number of years ago which showed that up to 49% of lamb losses occur at lamb and time. So it's a very important time in the in the the sheep farmer's calendar. And I suppose there was a study completed um recently there as well. And of the losses that take place, um, you know, 38% of those losses are are directly in uh, linked with infection and disease and uh, I suppose mainly hygiene and I suppose that's the purpose of, of my presentation here is the focus on hygiene and what we're doing in Ballyhays so I suppose it is com a commercial flock but it's it's also used for education purposes as well so we're trying to trying to do things as as best we can and as realistic as we can for for the students okay so I suppose I'm going to just focus briefly on in terms of hygiene biosecurity Yo hygiene, the role of the housing, I suppose a little bit on lamb hygiene, um, I suppose the role of ourselves and the students and the shepherding skills. And finally, then a little bit on facilities and equipment. And I'll hand over to my colleague Niall um, at that point. OK, so I suppose in terms of biosecurity, as I said at the outset, you know, we're operating a closed flock here, bar the purchase of uh, rams, you know, everything else is is homebred on the farm. I suppose there is a rodent control plan in place um, on the farm as well. 
But I suppose the biggest issue that, that we face is the large number of students and staff. And I suppose while it's great to have, you know, big numbers of students, I suppose the corresponding risk is that there are multiple potential sources, you know, of, of disease and infection, both for, you know, those coming into the farm and equally so for those leaving the farm. So I suppose we take a very strict stance on biosecurity in terms of, for example, the students, they all have to have their separate um, workwear that they use here in the college versus what they, what they would wear at home. And I suppose outside all of the sheds, then there are, a, you know, a foot facilities and uh, also a hand washing area available as well. And I suppose that's something that we kind of hammer home to the students. But equally so for anybody farming, uh, you know, the use of a foot bath going from shed to shed um, is, is certainly uh, worth, worth considering. Um, I suppose a wee bit on, on your hygiene, you know, and this this uh, might come up later on, the, the, the O's are winter shorn here in Ballyhays, and that, ha that has been conducted for a number of years now at this stage, predominantly to do with um, space limitations in the shed. But I suppose we do find that it leaves the O's um, quite clean when it comes down to lamb and thyme. Uh, but I suppose maybe for farmers who aren't winter shearing, certainly the role of, of dagging yos maybe in advance of, of going out with the ram may have some merit in terms of further further on in the season. In terms of parasite control, you know, the, the yos are plunge dipped um, before breeding and then after housing, and housing generally takes place in the first or second week of December. After housing, then um, the receives are fluke dose. And I suppose the idea behind that is that, you know, uh, yos are, are, are quite clean at the, at the rear end after after housing. Uh, I suppose the another point there is that the yos are foot bathed when housed. Um, and thankfully this year we hadn't too many lame yos, but nevertheless, it's something that's done routinely here on on the farm. Uh, so they were, they, they were uh, put through a, a zinc sulfate uh, foot bath. And then indeed, um, any sick yos or maybe the odd lame yo is is removed from group pens to uh, to avoid the spread of infection or or disease. Um, and that's kind of what what happens here in terms of keeping the yo clean. I suppose in the the main pens then, so uh, you know, both from the point of view of adapting the sheds that we have on the farm, uh, and also to show the different um flooring types. You know, we're to students. Um, we're operating a mix of plastic, mesh, and concrete slats, and we also have uh, a straw bedded area as well. And I suppose that that may come up, you know, a little bit later in the presentation in terms of which which type of slat that we find best. Um, chop silage is fed, so you know, there's a mixture of bale silage and and pit silage as well on the farm. But it's it's chop silage that's fed to the O's, and we find um, that this goes somewhat to reducing the, the level of block slats, but nevertheless, it, it can be a problem on some of the slats as well. I suppose the drinkers are maintained, particularly on the bedded sheds. Uh, you know, we, we try to keep the, the beds as clean as possible. So, you know, there's um, more drinkers are maintained and they're kept 600 millimetres above the floor. That's kind of what's, what's recommended. And then, of course, an appropriate stocking rate in the pen in terms of a slatted pen or the straw bedded sh shed, we try to, to keep to the stocking rates um, correct. And I suppose the fact that we're winter shearing, you know, it allows us to fit approximately 15 to 20% to more sheep in the pen. So that's, um, that's a plus side as well. In terms of the individual pens, and I know my colleague Niall will be coming on to this a wee bit later, but, you know, as Michael alluded to earlier on, bacteria and infection, you know, as lamb and season progresses, you know, maybe the attention to detail drops after a number of eight, late nights, you know, bacteria and infection tends to build up as the season goes on, pens start to get dirtier. And again, that's something we kind of emphasise to students in terms of keeping a clean and dry environment. Um, going to be a little bit um, easier said than dos done this year in terms of the, the straw shortages and whatnot. 
but nevertheless it, it is an area you know that that you have to focus on so i suppose the protocol here is you know the pens are cleaned out they're disinfected and a new straw is laid down between between the o's and i suppose we're fortunate here during laman we have a a good labour force. There's lots of students on hand, and um, but certainly for all farmers, insofar as possible, if if it can be done, it it, it should be done. Uh, the afterbirths from lambs are removed then from from the pens, you know, naturally to try and try and keep them that bit drier as well. So in terms of the lamb, you know, I know Michael has covered this in terms of colostrum, but I suppose just to reiterate the point, you know hygiene and and that is all well and good but if the lamb doesn't get enough colostrum it's it's off to a bad start so again that's something that we we really emphasize with the students but from a hygiene point of view you know we're we're, we're not doing anything groundbreaking here as such but it's it's i suppose it's about getting the basics right in terms of navels you know they're sprayed with iodine and that's repeated then a number of hours uh, later as well so they get two if not three sprays of iodine the bottles and stomach tubes you know they're used we have a number of bottles and stomach tubes you know they're, they're relatively cheap um cheap acid to have on the farm but they're very very important and i suppose it's just about as michael alluded to in his presentation that they're washed out and and sterilized and that they're i suppose in a way that they are not acting as a source of of infection um so that's also carried out on the farm in terms of the shepherd, you know, we can we can have the shed clean and the o clean and the lambs navels dipped. But if we are if we're going in to pull lambs and we don't have gloves on us or we have dirty clothes or whatnot, you know, we can act as a, a an introduction of infection. So as was in so far as possible, we try to ensure that the students all have clean workwear. Um, and I suppose that they, they're wearing disposable gloves. They won't be let into the shed unless they're wearing disposable gloves. And I suppose, you know, you buy a box of them there and they do you for the whole lamb and season. Certainly for all of us, you know, irrespective of the college situation, it's something all of us really should be doing. Uh, also, we have the single use arm length gloves uh, used for lamb. And, and I suppose that's important from the point of view of not introducing infection to the O. And, you know, when the, when the O you know, gets infection or that or disease maybe inside her, you know, you have issues like metritis or, or different diseases and that can can affect maybe the, the, the O's health and her ability to rear the lambs. So, and equally so, we don't want picking up any infection from the O as well. So it's it's good practice to, to wear those arm length gloves. Uh, so I suppose in terms of the workstation on the farm, you know, I suppose we're, we're fortunate. It's, it's fairly well kitted out again, it's it's nothing fancy, but I suppose there was just a little bit of thought put into it. It's location. It's located in the shed for the where the majority of the lamb and pens are located. Everything is on hand, and I suppose now you'll come to that a wee bit later in terms of the kind of equipment that we require. But I suppose the key thing is everything is on hand. I suppose there's kind of a, a stock take done before lamb, and we're kind of preparing ourselves as to what we need to have and uh, it's stored away and i suppose particularly with our medicines there you know obviously it's a, it's in a locked uh, locked cabinet on the right hand side then you'll see our sink and um you know we have an underwater heater so we always have a essentially we have a constant supply of hot water in the shed or warm water and again that's something that that everyone really should have or should consider i suppose at the bare minimum a kettle but ideally the, the hot water, uh, the under sink heater, and you can pick them up relatively cheaply in your local hardware stores and they're easy enough plumbed in as well. Uh, so that's the workstation. I suppose just to, to conclude my part of the presentation, you know, the key message that I would always be kind of saying to students there is in terms of achieving the high standards of hygiene, you know, in the lamb and shed really will pay dividends you know, when the sheep go out to grass in terms of increased lamb survival and I suppose reduced time and money treating sick yos and lambs. And I suppose, as we all know, anyone that's lamb and sheep, invariably, you know, you spend a large amount of your time on a very small number of sheep. So by really doubling down on the on the hygiene in the lamb and shed and in, van, in, in advance of lambing, I suppose we can try and reduce the 
the amount of, of sick lambs and sick yos. But I suppose that's a very apt point as well. You know, we're in an era of, of maybe tightening use and regulations on antibiotics. So anything that we can do to to avoid or minimize the use of those is, is obviously going to going to help things as well. So um, that concludes my part. I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Niall. Uh, thank you, Fergus, and good evening, folks. And um, thanks, Kieran and Michael, for having me on here this evening. Um, so, look, yeah, I'm going to talk a wee bit now on lamb equipment and probably a bit that's involved in here in the college um, through myself and um, the farm staff, the external staff and students um, throughout the lamb season. So probably just a bit on the lamb equipment itself. Um, we've all seen through the focus below here what we need and what's needed on the farm. Look, what I do try to do here is we have two lamb and sheds, um, have a bucket and each shed, um, have your lamb and gloves, your iodine, your, um, your lamb and gel, Anything that's needed, have it in the bucket, have it ready to go that you're not chasing yourself throughout your shed, especially them early hours in the morning um, where you might be able to find something as easy. Um, look, big thing for us, well, have it and have surplus supplies always on hand. Um, there's probably nothing more than so 3 o'clock in the morning, lamb and sheep, and you can't find iodine, you can't find the gloves when you need it most. Um, a couple of other wee things you see it there, the applicator for putting on your rings and your um, talking your tails. Your tags there, probably the most important tag at the time of year is your coil tag. Remove any problems, um, and that's the most but the, the, the highest time of year you're going to identify them colios is in them couple of weeks at Lamb. So always have your cull tags ready and ready to go to, 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 to remove them yews from the flock later on in the year. Um, that brings me on then to a uh, bit on data collection. And what we do here on the farm, I suppose, especially we're correlated a lot here with the from an educational point of view. Um, all lambs that are, that's born on the farm after about 24, 36 hours of age when they're good and strong, they're weighed, um, they're tagged at birth, and then they're correlated back on the handheld device you see on my um, on my right-hand side here. So you can see here students, they get a very good opportunity to to tag lambs at birth, weigh in lambs at birth. So they get a really good insight into, into the actual start and life of the, of the data collection on that point of view. Um, then also the Brandon and the, the Radlin recording that's done on the farm. So these are very good management techniques and um, good take home mention. I find students do actually very, adopt it as, uh, very well and get a lot of a lot of insight into it. And um, the photo on your left here, you can actually see a group of students that was working with me um, pre-breeding. What we have here is body condition score and yo's going on, um, grouping yo's before breeding. And then I think France at the back and he's actually branding the yo's. The reason they brand the yo's here and I find it's a very good way of, of, of improving the flock um, and an easy management technique to bring into place is is you know what yo's go now with the rams. You're selecting your uh, yo's to go to the rams. And in this case here, yo brand in group number one, they're going to offer our bell clairs. So we know then that that at lamb and time does in group number one. In the first two weeks at lamb and um, are back to the, the, the bell clairs and those lambs are chosen for, for replacements. And um, group number two then and group number three, whatever whatever amount of groups that I, that I have or what I want, they will all be, um, they'll all be selected and rams chosen to go with that group. As you can see in the photo on the right-hand side, what we do is um, put the rattling on the on the yos. You start off with a bright colour, a yellow colour at the start, work your way through then as the weeks go on and darken that colour. main reasons for that too is known for, from my point of view, for that group number one, that, and that's made it in the first two weeks, in group number one, that's my replacement. So at the barn there, those first two weeks, they'll be kept. And then as the weeks go on, then all the rest of them lambs brought for slaughter. Um, the big point of view I do find is come scanning time, is the yos. Are, are are housed then accordingly to the, scan, the litter size, but fed then accordingly to it. So you could have used lamb and now in the next three weeks. You might have used lamb for three weeks after that. So it's feeding them accordingly to the time that are actually suitable to, to or suitable due to lamb then. So identifying replacements, this is also something that's done with the students on the farm. It's just a simple technique that I find it, I find it very beneficial for for the flock and improving the flock. Just pick them uh, them young lambs um at birth, and that's what they will be doing. Like I said earlier on, but the branding. The rattling of the of the rams and the rams going out with each group. You know when your yo lambs are going to be born and on the farm. Just a simple technique I have about be in the middle of the tag is the disc, the color disc, and you have a different color for each year. Um, I know some tags you can get the, the, the year actually print on the back of the tag. I go with the discs here, and then look everything scanned uh, on, on the handheld um, and recorded. The main things look we'll be looking out for here is the mother and ability, uh, the twins, the triplets. Predominantly, we're keeping them. Um, the milk yields, the classroom quality, the, the yo's mother ability, all them little aspects come into play in that first 24 hours. And then that's how we're cho chosen our, our yo lambs. I suppose, look at some of us, what we might end up doing is, you know, the weaning time of, of, of any flock is generally then what you might do is pick out your 30, 40 or 50 best yo lambs based on how they look and how they're performing at that stage. 
sometimes you know you're missing the fact that that the some of our daughters the, the youths sorry the mothers of the MUs have been called already and um, from the flock so was it beneficial to keep them maybe not so the first two weeks that's when I know that whatever's chosen then that's it and you've you made your mind up and I find it's a great way of improving the flock um throughout the years. Um, other speakers one I've spoken to this already the culling of the O's identify them culls um, like that have your cull tag ready have it in the box um, when you're tagging your lambs when you're when you're scanning your lambs up just do the same with the O it's your, it's your best opportunity to find them O's and um, we've all been in a situation where you've took a prolapse harness off a yo and you've lambed the lamb or the two lambs out of her you forget to put a cull tag into her you're wondering in the following February or March why is that yo prolapsing on me again you forgot to remove it from the flock have the cull tags there have them removed um, that's the best opportunity I find to do them. Lamb pens, and I know um, Michael and Ferris have spoken this. Um, so look, ideally five foot by five foot or six foot by four foot, you can get, you know, five by four. I find the five foot by five foot hurdle, the drop down in, it's easy access, you can see through the gate um, and the ideal pen for the yo with the twin or especially the triplet that, um, that the lambs and the yo are safe in that. Correct hygiene at all times. Look, I do find if you can clean out the, the, the yo after she leaves that pen, rather than let three or four yo's lamb in that pen and keep top it up with straw, it reduces the workload on you, on yourself, um, and leaves it easier. Sufficient cleaning and disinfectant, a little bit of lime, as Michael said, any type of lime, just get lime in there, clean it up, dry up that pen, have it ready there for the next yo to come into. Access then of water and silage at all times. I'll speak probably in my next, I'll speak in my next slide about the water and the, the water, different water systems, but have it there, have it always on supply and on demand uh, for, for that yo. Pen numbering, you can see it in that bottom picture there, we, in the college here, we've got pen numbers above each pen, and I'll speak about that also in a minute. Um, very beneficial, very easy to follow, um, especially here with external staff or with staff or with students. Um, you know, you own pen number twenty four, like that's that that's numbered there. Very easy to give 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 a message across, and and and, and these things very easy to work down. Um, sufficient pens again. Look, one pen per eight to ten yos. Let's have eight to ten pens per hundred yos on the farm should be sufficient for a a general mid season block. Uh, water, this is the three different types of uh, water systems we have here on the farm. Um, so the one on the left is your typical five litre blue bucket. Um, and very easy to, to use, very easy to see is the yo drinking, how much water is that yo drinking. The one thing I would definitely say with them is a lot of farmers, you might see it, the bucket just sitting on the straw, sitting in the corner of the, of the, of the lamb pen. What could happen on that very easily is the yo trying to get the lambs up the sucker, the lambs trying to get up themselves for the first time. You could lose a lamb or maybe two lambs very easily having that bucket. So the wee hinges that you see that you can get from them, clip them on the side of the gate, have them sitting up, you know, a good foot or more that the lamb has no access to that water. And um, the one thing I would say about that, if you've 20, 30 lamb and pens and that Joe's going to drink, as Michael says, up to 10 litres of water in a day, you will find yourself running over and back to fill them buckets a lot during the day. Like that, you're spending a lot of time with it. Have that 200 litre barrel or a couple of them barrels to try to sheds. That's quick and it's easy to fill them buckets at all times. The middle before you see there, so we call it in the top shed. It's just a standard sewer pipe with a slot um, cut out in the middle or in the side of it. Um, cheap, cheerful, easy to use. Um, all there's a ball cock in the end. You have a, an opening and closing to clean it out as much as you want. You'll always have water there. It's, it's accessible for you and um, very easy to work. The third one then, as you see on the right, is what we'd have is the bowls and they're attached onto the wall as well. Around your five foot by five foot hurdle. Um, like that, look very good on the pen. Just clean, has to be cleaned out when you're cleaning a lamp and there could be feces of that in, in the actual bowl itself. Some of them find that the bowl itself could clock, could blog, and um, the ball cock mightn't just work on the rest. It's overflowing in the back and you could actually soak out and soak a lamp and bend very quickly that. The other problem with the bowl is such expensive, you're probably talking 40, 45 euro, 50 euro maybe, but what you see hanging on the wall there. Um, but look, all different ways and means of it. The one thing to take home message with water is the yo needs a lot of water, so have the water there for her. If you want to talk about getting that and on it, just, just have water accessible at all times for them. Um, orphan and pet lambs. And you know, there's probably a lot of people at home dreading now after the scan that about the triplets we're going to be facing into. But look, we're all going to have them. They're on every farm. How to manage them, I suppose, and the best ways and means of, of keeping them pet lambs alive and, and, uh, and the best source of for them. So look, milk, set up your pen, the milk feeder, have a pen there. Um, get your feeder, have your feeder got before lamb. And I'll you'll see a slide on the, uh, after this one. But have everything ready, ready to go on it. That surplus lamb, your pet lamb as such, Move them about 24, 36 hours after they're born. Um, you will find as the lamb progresses and you're going into a peak lambing period, that pet lamb might have to be removed from that yo. 
before 24 hours so ensure that that lamb's got the correct amount of colostrum and stomach tube into it mark it put a colour code on it a number or a letter put into the lamb pen that you will remember it write it on a whiteboard and um, that you remember that the lamb has to be monitored throughout the day to ensure that it's all right and um, on the feeder itself set the temperature to the to the max degree for the first 10 days reduce that temperature then to the minimum setting from uh, from 10 days to 20 days and then from 20 days on until weaning at 35 days and um, cold milk is sufficient at that stage um, yeah, and that's just another backup. Don't waste time. We have a lot of time. Um, a lot of time is going into lambing and, and and monitoring everything at lambing and and managing everything. The photo on your left is you all know what that is. It's it's me feeding pet lambs at a bottle, and your pet lambs pulling at you, eating your jumper. And um, best thing that could be done: get yourself a pet lamb feeder, like you see on the right. That feeder, I think there's seventeen lambs in that pen, uh, feeding that 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 feeder, just a standard ten liter feeder, and um, like that. Have it set up. Have it ready to go. Um. Have the pen set up. Don't waste time uh, chasing your tail uh, at lamb time. Run out the pet lambs. Um, group penning then. Uh, as you can see, or there's a photo on the right. That was that was here last March, twenty twenty three, and we had a good fall of snow. And our time for them lambs are, are are a week or two old and survived it. But the photo on your left, as you can see, it's a good open pen. It's a pen where you can put your yews and lambs. A group pen as such. So any issues, any problem yews, any foster maybe that you want to keep in or like that, the weather breaks. And you can keep them in to get that extra bit of a bonding session in time. And it is just reduces the workload as such that, you know, you'll find issues on a yo or lamb, maybe three or four days of age inside in the shed. Most of them find outside. Obviously, look, on the deal like we're after having today, we all probably wish we were lambing and getting yo's and lambs out. But the weather's going to change. We don't know what we're up facing up again. So it's just to have that in the back of your mind and have something like that ready um, to gear forward for going into, going into the spring. Um, big one here, and especially when for myself and Fergus is working here with students, external staff, and the staff that is here is the communication. I suppose we're all at home, even on our own farms, the communication between people coming in and coming out of the farm, and you couldn't have enough ways and means of getting that, that getting that, um, getting that point across on what's been done, what hasn't been done, what has to be done, and um, so look. What I do find here best up in the sheep sheds is the whiteboards. Um, they're available in every shed that's up there. There's markers there. If there's students here or or or, or staff, I'd always be saying, whatever you think that's wrong or it's right, what has to be done, write it down, record everything. Um, the photo on your left, the antibiotic records, possibly more so for myself, that's doing a lot of the remedy usage on the farm. Um, so look, we all know ourselves three, four weeks into lamb, you forget maybe the tag number, the year you get that that's antibiotics too so I'll write all on the boards take a photograph of the boards full wipe it out go again that's a great indication you can see there there's five slots for the date the antibiotic was given so if you've been on a course of antibiotics over four or five days you know that each day it's been done or it's not been done and it just keeps you on top of that and I find it actually nearly reduces your your, your workload with antibiotics and reduces the illness and infects the passing through on them used. Um, the other one then on the right hand side uh, is just identifying the pain Many sheep are in that pen. You can see here there's pen 14, there's 19 yews in it, all scanned twins, and currently on 500 grams of meal. Um, big one for us with that is, especially with external staff or staff maybe at weekends that's feeding if it wasn't here, that if they can't get in contact with me, they can't be in touch. It's easy, it's simple, and that's updated every week. So, of course, as the meal feeding goes, uh, increases as the coming closer to the lamb, and the meal feeding increases too. So, that can be changed, can be seen every week. It's a very good indication. But the big one for me probably is the one in the middle here. Um, just Playing some bit of cardboard um, and the cable tie stuck to the to the lamb hurdle. Pen number twelve. Lambs twins born this morning half five. That was on the second of March. Both lambs have sucked. The navels have sprayed, and it then signified by myself. Then so that means that the next person coming in, let it be half six or seven o'clock, walking by the pen, they know what's going on. It's just a brief overview to see what's happening. We all of that when someone walks in. Was them lambs sucked? Where the tubes? Is everything right with them lambs? When how long are they born? Gives you an indication maybe then, you know, is that lamb 24 hours old, 26 hours old, time enough to get them out of that lamb and that lamb and pen and move them on. So there's kind of different ways and means I find of getting that communication point across. Uh, just to include then, folks, um, a few different things like that. Identify your call yo's. Look, it's going to reduce future problems um, within the flock. There's enough issues at lamb at time without holding on to them issues. So reduce them as quick as you can. Uh, communication for us here, the students, the staff, clear instructions at all times throughout the, that time of year. Supplies, like I mentioned, don't be lambing sheep at that early in the morning and don't have, not having your iodine or your lamb and gel or your lamb and gloves. Have plenty of it in supply. Have it, have it got up. Uh, the data recording and the benefits. Um, look, we've all seen that and how it's proved the flock here on the branding, the rattling of sheep. It's another thing I'd say on that. 
don't go to the hassle of branding your yos, rattling your rams, uh, scanning your sheep, not to get the full benefits out of it at the very end. Carry through with it. Uh, house your yos according to your litter size. Feed accordingly to that. Um, and you will find that the benefits throughout. Big one for us then as well. The group pen, if possible, have a group pen available. Just when weather difficulties are there, that you have an option to house uh, yos and their lambs. Maybe sick yos and their lambs fostering, etc. like I said. Um, so that is for me there, folks. So thanks so much for listening. Hope it's okay. And take any questions. Okay, thanks for that, Neil. Just getting everyone back on there. Uh, look, that was an interesting overview of what's going on in college. I think it's very useful. I taught the card one, actually, on the gates. Look, even if you had other people in the chat, uh -huh. sometimes even keeping track yourself of, did you tube that lamb? Which one did you tube? You know, it's a very simple thing to put on it. Like, that's, it's just curry board you're using. So imagine plastic, cardboard, anything like that will work as well. Yeah, no, and at all, and at all. Um... Work. It's just to get that point across, get that thing across. I'll have a book there in the office, um, what Fergus showed earlier on. Just a book is there, sign it off, write it up, just keep keeps on top of the next person. It's all about getting that communication point across as, as easy and as quickly as possible. Yeah, no, it's just one of them simple things. Look, I'll give the two-year break just for a moment. Michael, a couple of questions just to put you back over. One general one, maybe, and it has come up before. Uh, it's just around Hepatovac P availability. Look, what time of vaccination, there might be some supply issues. Any maybe insight on that? Yeah, okay, Kieran, I, I'm I'm not an expert on the supply line for Heptavec P, but certainly I, I think um what we were hearing is that there, there was an issue and I think it has is in either has been resolved or is in the process of being resolved. So people need to keep in contact with their vet or yeah. merchant and just uh, it's it's either landed or on the way. Yeah, so I just want to keep a track on. Okay, look the foster lamb one and you you went through the different procedure and um Maybe just two questions on this one. How old would you consider fostering a lamb? You know, for the pet lamb, obviously, it's been taken off. And the other one is, look, in the case of a triplet, which lamb do you pick, the biggest or the smallest? Or how how important is it to kind of keep them fairly even when you're trying to match them up? Yep, yep. Very, they're very good questions. Um, the, the oldest lamb, I think, is a kind of a, a, a bit of a suck and see approach, kind of, you know, it, it depends on, on the lamb. So look at, you'd often see an older lamb, maybe where you has lost her own lamb and she'll take an older lamb, no bother. Um, the challenge often with with the older lambs um, that you're fostering on can be that, for example, uh, if they're so used to being fed by the bottle that they mightn't mightn't be able to figure or have lost or, or don't remember how to 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 go to the o and um you know the the lamb has to be eager and want to suck as well for the o to take it like you know so there there's a little bit of that so look at for 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 you know it we're, we're probably talking about a couple of days but i mean um you know i'd say probably up to a week would be no bother for most lambs after that then look but i have seen older lambs being fostered on to yos and and um that have in particular yos that have lost lambs or maybe even if you had a yo that died out in the field you'd have two older lambs um potentially could foster them onto a, a, a yo, um, uh, and and there'd be no problem because they they they're used to sucking. In terms of the lamb, so there's a little bit of uh, often a bit of discussion about that. I try and leave the 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 yo go out with two evenly sized lambs. Um, so often if if there's a very very small lamb, that's the guy to maybe take and put into the pet lamb pen, but. It's probably not going to be the chap that's going to be picked out to go fostering onto a big single. If you had, you know, reasonable size triplets, now you know that they were kind of average weights four, four kilos or something like that. Or and one of them was a little bigger, I'd probably pull him off the bigger lad, and um and he'd be he or she would be more better matched to to the a single if you were going on, you know, that you wouldn't have that uh, disparity in size. Even though you know, look at there's there's lots of you always go out with two lambs where there's a disparity in size and there's no problem like so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just look if the lamb is strong enough. That's supposed to be most important bit there. Yeah. Okay. Um. Just look when I have you on that one. There is a question in the but you know that lamb that is well able to get up. It's a strong lamb, but just won't suckle. And you, know, we've all seen them where you put them on and still won't go. Probably a lamb might need a bit of intervention for a while first to get them trained in. Any tips on that? Get them to suck, or is it just something you have to give a bit of time to? Yeah, it's okay if you if you have a lamb that won't suck and can't or can't suck maybe or 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 they won't let it suck. And it's very important that we get the classroom in there early anyway for the starters just to get the immunity up and running. Um, so that's a stomach tube job really. Um, you know if it's not going to suck, um, then the stomach tube after that. Then, um, once we have given the, the lamb a good start in life, I suppose it's it's to keep trying encouraging it like you know and and hopefully eventually it'll get going. And we probably see that sometimes, you know, a lamb that. 
maybe it's a very big lamb or a bit, a bit of a silly lamb and he won't suckle you and he'll take the bottle and you know so you're you're bottling the lamb for 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 a couple of days and eventually the lamb stops taking the bottle it's mm -hmm. figured it out and it gets going on the yo like you know so they, they, those are kind of awesome of those options like you know but look at the important thing i suppose is once the lamb is 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 well fed in the first day and has established its immune system and is is going you can probably leave it a little bit hungry to kind of try and encourage it you know but yeah. i mean it needs a minimum amount of feed but with the newborn lamb that's not the job the newborn lamb if it's not going to suck we need to go in there with a stomach tube and look at there are a number of videos there on the chagas um, youtube channel if you type in sheep stomach tubing or lamb mortality workshops or things like that there's lots of different videos on on how to do that how to stomach tube lambs yeah. and you know how to be sure you're in the right spot you're in the right spot but like that that first feed is essential so it has to be good now i might just more on that topic to throw one to you like you mentioned the cold eggs i think it's probably one of the the best investments you have in the shed at that time of year like so for those yo's with the big teats as well, that can be a problem, you know, treading or cording in the teats. That's something I imagine you check each time, like you're culling for those reasons as well, with your young flock and belly hairs. Completely, yeah, definitely, uh, Kieran. Yeah, look, it is one of them aspects you have to do it, and it's year on year, you're never going to eliminate. You're going to always have a couple of yews coming on like that. Um, and, and, and as Michael has touched around it, it's it, how you manage them, a couple of lambs to come on afterwards, there's a couple you have to go to the pet lamb, then there's still something to be stomach tubed. But just managing that, yeah, and like that, you've mentioned the cull the cull tag like the, that that yo after she lambs them first three or four days she's going to cause issues you get them lambs suckling mm -hmm. that yo bag it kind of dries up after a month or six weeks outside it comes off you forget that that was the yo nearly that, that caused them issues so it, 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 you're not going to remember her come weaning you're not going to remember the turn her way her bag might be perfectly formed then at that stage um, so look the cull tag in her it signifies it signifies that she is a cull, yeah. cull yo I've often seen that even here you might cull out 25 yo's at weaning time with their tags in their ears and you could look at the group of sheep and actually say they're a very good sheep, group of sheep and you nearly forget as to why why are these calls? Is there actually any reason behind that? So it's another thing that I often do actually myself is is having on the phone, on the notes, type in the O's tag number, a reason why she was called. You'll have it there. And it actually is very beneficial then going forward. Have you had a high call rate for, as you say, prolapse or, or other issues or mastitis or bad vulnerability? How can I improve on that? How can I how can I rectify that issue going forward for next year? So I'm not going to weigh off the topic, but as you said, cull tags, have them in your pocket, have them in your up your sleeve, have them in the bucket, have them everywhere when you do need them, they're there for you. No, I think it's a fair point. Look, as you indicated there, come weaning time, a lot of them issues you won't see, so you can forget what the problems were, cuts down a lot of the issues in the labour. Fergus, um, I might throw this one to you. Look, you mentioned with the different type of slats. Any tips for, you know, maybe I'll, I'll split this one. Any tips for keeping them clean in terms of where you're feeding bale silage and do you clean them out between it or do you find much of a difference between the different types of slats you're using? Yeah, so I suppose, as I said there, we have a mix of um, mesh, concrete and plastic slats. And I suppose just what we find, you know, um, from from personal experience here, myself and Niall, probably the, the plastic slat is coming out on top um, I suppose in terms of cleanliness, the O's appear to be staying that bit cleaner on them. But you know, irrespective of slat type, all of them, you know, can be can get clogged to a certain extent. So as I said, you know, we do try and feed the chopped bales or or the pit silage insofar as possible. We try and feed the the drier silage on the farm, maybe harder found this year. Um, and then I suppose occasionally, you know. We do have to, you know, rake the slats, you know, that there's no point in saying occasionally that does happen. We also have on some of the pens, and I suppose it works to a varying degree, um, we have a, a sort of a, a, a mesh barrier and we sit that down on top of the silage. And I suppose it kind of forces the O's to an extent to pick the silage through the mesh. But... I couldn't honestly say that it's having a huge bear and on keeping the slats clean, but I suppose again because we're a college, it's sort of there for for demo purposes. But basically, short chop length has a big role to play, and I suppose also in some of the pens, and as I said, you know some of the sheds have been adapted. We've kind of we work with what we have. Some of the pens that have a concrete toe piece in front of the slat, as opposed to the slat running directly up to the barrier I suppose we probably would find to an extent that they stay a bit cleaner Okay yeah no and look I think the mesh that's similar to what we see in a lot of car trailers that if for anyone's just not clear like they can just pull through it they're not dragging it into the pen with them I suppose is, is the theory on that one Exactly yeah 
Okay, Michael, I might just go back to you for a moment there. Um, just on care that neonatal lamb. There's a question in there about spraying and dipping. I suppose Neil mentions or Fergus mentions spraying. Look, if you're doing, I suppose it has to be done right. Preference between the two, or maybe any advice on those are spraying. Yeah. Okay. So, look, I'm a fan of dipping. Um, when I when I do workshops with farmers, I I always say to them, if you caught your finger on a really rusty nail, would you bathe it or would you spray it? Um. Uh, it's very rare that somebody honestly says they'd spray it rather than bathe it. The the navel is basically a it, it's a tube going into the lamb's liver and stomach. It's a highway for bugs to get in. I suppose if it is sprayed really really well, both sides and all around, and you know a lot of care and attention taken to it, you know I mean you could probably argue it's as good as dipping. And I, I think um, but generally I suppose. When we're under pressure and lambing, I, I don't think everyone is going to spray the navel with that care and attention. And whereas if you just have a little shot glass, that's what we use generally, these plastic little okay. shot glasses. They're about 20 mils, half filled with ID and 10 mils. You know, in, in, cup the navel into it and, 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 and just push it up against the belly. And it, it really clean. It washes and, and cleans out the navel and, and, and you know, sterilizes it. And it, it's not a big job um, once people are set up with it. And you you do the entire litter with that one little half cup of ID and then you you toss out what's left and and so i'd be a fan of 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 um dipping i think dipping is better than than spraying um you know and i think it's it's harder to make a mess of the dipping it's yeah. much easier to not spray something properly um once you have it inside in a little cup and you've dipped it it's dipped you know there's, I think there's no ambiguity about it the boys did make a useful point there like they need to go back sometimes after a couple of hours you know they always after licking it go back in with another bit again uh, always go uh, back absolutely yeah second times yeah so when you move the yo from the lamb from the the group pen into the lambing pen that's the time to do the navel and then three or four hours later when you're coming back to check and make sure that the lambs yeah. have sucked and everything is all right that's the time to do it a second time i'm conscious of time here so i'm just maybe going to throw one final question you michael just put you back in the classroom i'm going to parse this one slightly um, your preference in order of substitutes, so maybe from another freshly lamb, Joe, cow, class, some artificial, what order you'd rank them in. And maybe I'll just throw the scenario to you, you know, a triplet Joe, you might only get 150 mils, 200 mils of colostrum offer. If the three lambs steer the feed, what's the practice with that 200 mils and how much substitute do you go with? Okay, yeah. So look at in in order of importance, definitely number one is Joe's colostrum. So that's the best um, by a country mile, right? Um the, the second best, I suppose, from an anti-body uh, immunoglobulin transfer point of view would be a vaccinated cow. So if you're doing your yours with Tribovex 10 or Covaxin 10 or Heptavec P or whatever you're using, if you could vaccinate a couple of your cows and mix a bit of milk um, from those and your yone is free and you use 30% more. So there's a lot of ifs there on that one. Um, that's the one I would be saying would be number two. And then number three would be the classroom substitutes. If I was going for a classroom substitute, I would go one that was based on... Um, uh, bovine colostrum so one that was made from dried bovine colostrum because i just feel that you want to get higher levels of immunoglobulins in that um uh so so that's that's i suppose the 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 order in which i would would put them uh, the second question is so you milk this yo you need you've got three lambs on the ground they need 200 mils each so you need 600 mils of of colostrum for some reason or another the lambs won't suck you're going to have to intervene and, and tube them you milk the yo you have 200 mils of yo's um colostrum so ideally we'd get more milk from another yo in the flock and you know if that's our colostrum and if that's available obviously that's the best shot if that's not available then and we're going with either the cow's colostrum or the artificial colostrum very important that we make up the, the the deficit, mix it all together and give each lamb the 200 mils from the mixed um, solution. So that's a mixture of yo's milk and whatever alternative we're using, be that cow's colostrum or artificial colostrum. The important thing is that every lamb gets some yo's colostrum so that we get some transfer of those uh, antibodies um, in, into the lamb. Okay. Look, folks, we're going slightly over time, so we are. That's probably my fault, not keeping us on track, but, but I think it's been a very interesting overview. Certainly, it's timely at the moment. Michael, look, appreciate you coming on. Fergus, Neil, it was great getting insight and some lovely tips and tricks there as well for coming on. Look, thank you very much for your presentations. I'd like to thank the attendees for tuning in. There will be a recording of this webinar available on YouTube for anyone to look back on in the coming days. Uh, that's it for us. Look, wish you all the best with Lamon this year. Um, we'll be back. Hopefully back in the next year or less talk sheep webinars and we'll be joining you weekly with our podcast. So look, stay tuned for more information coming from us. So that's it, folks. Thank you very much for coming on.